afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Josh Goldstein. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Woodrow Wilson School and work with the Center for Information and Technology Policy. Um, I'm, I'm also a preceptor for a class that just had its last class yesterday, Technology and Society. And in the class, we talked about um, taking on really, really hard problems. Uh, so the types of problems that will make a big difference in a generation or and and more um, And so I'm really really pleased uh, to have dr. Oliver Rothschild here um, to talk about a project that's really captured my imagination um, And I wanted to make sure he could come and, and share his ideas with you about uh, Kepler um, so he's going to talk about um, ways that through both online and in person uh, teaching, we can think about ways to reinvent higher education in emerging markets. Um, Oliver's done uh, lots of really fun stuff. Um, he helped create a scholarship fund called Generation Rwanda. Um, he's worked with McKinsey and currently with the state of Massachusetts, or until recently with the state <laughs> of Massachusetts. Um, and the last time I saw Oliver was on the Uganda-Rwanda border at a Fresh Lake uh, sort of um, uh, nature preserve. And so it's, that was several years ago, so I'm really happy to um, welcome him here today to talk about Kepler. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Um, so it's cool to be, I mean, last time Josh and I saw each other was in uh, rural Uganda. Um, and it's, but it's exciting to also have these conversations, not only in rural uh, Uganda, I just got back from a trip to South Africa and Kenya, um, but also to come to a place like Princeton where uh, higher education has been, um, you know, that provides really fantastic higher education for, for, for a certain group and a certain culture and talk about the, these ideas here. Um, so. Uh, like Josh said, um, we're really rethinking what higher education looks like um, in the developing world. Uh, we're starting with a, a project in Rwanda, like Josh said. Um, I founded uh, with a partner um, an organization called Generation Rwanda about 10 years ago. So uh, Generation Rwanda is a scholarship program that uh, finds really high potential uh, young people in Rwanda mostly um, and sends them to local universities. Uh, and over the last 10 years, we've been pretty successful at sort of what we set out to do. Um, find a pretty small group of really vulnerable students and sort of work with them, coach them, build supplementary programs around the universities uh, they're involved with. Um, and, uh, and sort of help them um, get through university and get on to productive employment. So we've been successful there. Um, but over the last 10 years, what we've really realized is that a lot of our success is driven not by what's coming out of the universities we work with, um, but sort of all these supplementary wraparound programs we're doing. This is actually sort of a dramatic example. This is a university in West Africa. Um, but, but broadly, across most emerging markets, and this even extends to, uh, we have a, uh, a group in India we're, we're talking to and researching there. Um, but across emerging markets, higher education in um, in these places means really expensive professors who deliver mostly passive learning. So they stand at the front of classrooms and lecture for a couple hours, and students are supposed to copy it down and memorize it. Um, the professors, although they're incredibly expensive and they're you know, very highly skilled, some of the most highly skilled folks in a lot of these economies, um, they don't show up. They, they don't really think about being great teachers. Um, and and, and the, really, the really big outcome that's, that's sort of the most, the most challenging outcome and what we do most of our work at Gener or what we have done most of our work at Generation Rwanda on is these universities don't prepare students to actually go into jobs. Um, so, so you have all, all of these quality challenges and all these outcome challenges and at the same time the costs are unsustainable for these economies. So um, this is a picture of the grandmother of one of our scholarship recipients. Um, and, and in the sort of application process last year, uh, this, this applicant told us the story of her grandmother saving for, you know, three or five years to contribute to her university education. 
as a subsistence farmer in Rwanda, she saved about $150 towards uh, you know, a five or $10,000 education. So the, 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 the earning power of most folks on the ground in Rwanda just doesn't match what the current model of university costs. And this problem is much bigger than Rwanda. And, and the more we explore, um, it's much bigger than the costs and, and, and the professors. Um, if you look broadly across emerging markets, um, you see there's a fundamental disconnect between what universities are offering and what students and, and, and by proxy employers need. Um, and to some extent, this is true e even in the US. Uh, you know, we have social support networks. We've got student loan programs. Um, we have a lot of things which sort of, we've got unemployment programs. We've got employers who are rich enough to retrain students. Um, but in a place like Rwanda or Kenya or South Africa or India that's growing incredibly quickly, that doesn't have these social support networks, um, these problems are huge. So uh, this was actually, you know, a few days ago, you know, while I was putting together this talk, um, The Economist has a big feature about how badly universities are doing preparing people for employment. McKinsey launched this big study. Um, this is my favorite chart that if you ask higher ed providers, and no, no, I'm sure no one in this room falls in this category. If you ask higher ed providers, about three quarters of them say, we are doing a great job preparing students for employment. If you ask students or employers, less than half of them agree. And we, we, think, we think a lot of this is driven by a core sort of supply and demand mismatch. So um, there's a story. My, when my grandparents first got electric blankets, electric blankets, they're like this pad that goes in your bed, and you have like this little controller that turns it up and down. So when they first got electric blankets, it was like a cold night. And my grandfather installed them himself. Um, and he's pretty hot generally, so he had his turned on a low setting. Um, my grandmother was freezing, so turned hers up. Um, my grandfather got hotter and hotter and turned his farther and farther down. My grandmother, by the end of the night, was shivering while my grandfather was sweating. Um, and it turned out the controllers were plugged into the wrong electric blankets. <laughs> And, and I tell that story, uh, you know, I tell that story just to show that um, it, it's a way I sort of think about when you have a provider of a service and a consumer of a service completely disconnected, or, or even worse, connected to someone else, it, it, it's hard to get the results right. And I, I, we think that's what's going on with, with higher education and employment in the developing world, um, and, and honestly in, in the US. There's no connection between uh, universities and really the consumers of the results of universities, which to a large extent are employers. Um, again, it's, it's okay in the U.S., but, but in a place where your ability to get a job, where you're, you're making a big gamble by spending, you know, uh, five or ten years of the, the annual per capita income on university, you're taking this huge gamble and it's not paying off. Um, so, so this is a big problem. Over the last couple of years, uh, there have been a few things that sort of gelled in our mind, that gelled in sort of the, the collective uh, conversations going on around higher education um, and technology that sort of helped us shape a, a, a different vision of what this could look like and, and helps us really get to the heart of, um, of some of these issues. Um, and I think the biggest one and the one that's sort of been in everyone's, uh, been in the New York Times the most frequently um, is, this is Tom Friedman writing a few weeks ago about um, the online education uh, sort of world. Um, does, does everyone in the room have anyone heard? Of, everyone in the room heard of a MOOC? Um, so, so, so a MOOC is is this idea, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But it's this idea that um, as uh, technology gets better and as content becomes cheaper to create and and distribute, um, a lot of universities, including Princeton. Um, are now spreading a lot of their content, a lot of their teaching out, out to the world. So, so that's, that's one, and that's probably the most sort of public, the one that's got the most attention. Um, but, but we're really building Kepler with, with three pillars. And, 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 and I talked a little bit about sort of the, the content piece. Um, that's driven by, you know, Coursera is a big player there, edX. I don't know if those names sound familiar, but um, that, that's sort of one chunk that's really driving this. Uh, a second chunk is, you know, active learning has been around forever. Um, but, but over the last sort of five or 10 years, organizations like there's a network of charter schools called KIPP, um, you know, the organization Teach for America. But it's, it's happening really at the sort of primary and secondary school level. Um, 
in the US and abroad, uh, we're finally able with technology to really measure what's working and what's not in actual teaching methodology. So the, the, the shift from um, you know, this passive um, consumption of content, we're actually figuring out how to, how to do better and how to, how to build active learning into, into, uh, into education. And then I think the third piece is there are employers out there in the world who recognize this is a problem. You know, you saw the Economist article, but McKinsey, who's a big employer in a lot of these countries, um, you know, is taking this really seriously. Google and IBM are two that in Africa are sort of a little bit ahead of the curve, but, but overall we're finding employers who are excited to engage on these issues and excited to engage not only with the theoretical solutions, but excited to get down in the trenches and see how to improve higher ed. So I'm going to take each of these uh, in turn and tell you sort of how they contribute and shape um, uh, our model. So, so starting with, with content. Um, we see this incredible, this exciting trend towards uh, lower and lower costs, really high quality online content. Um, a lot of these MOOCs and Coursera and, and these, these companies, you know, it's unclear yet how they're going to make money. But what is clear is that they are going to reach a lot more people and per student they're going to be a fraction of the cost of, uh, of existing lectures. So whereas five or ten years ago it cost probably a couple thousand dollars to sit in on a Princeton lecture, uh, for, for a semester. Um, now it costs zero. Maybe, maybe it gets up to you know, $50 um, if some of these business models that these MOOCs are playing with work out, but it's a lot cheaper. And, and beyond cost, this, this, this sort of, so, so cost is a big one, and you saw the, the average income versus the average tuition. Um, there, there's a huge demand for education, so getting cost down is really important. But there are a couple other things. Um, uh, that are also really exciting about the sort of MOOC trend and the online education trend. One is, is the quality of the outcome. So, so right now, Rwanda chooses its economics uh, sort of syllabus and teaching methods and professor based on are there any economists living in Barrera, Rwanda? And, and maybe there's one, maybe there's someone who's, who, who kind of knows a little bit about economics and, and reads from Wikipedia. Um, but, but suddenly now we're, we're able to get, we're not only able to remove that sort of big, big cost from the structure, um, but we're also able to look around the world and find out who's really the best at teaching economics and what's really the best syllabus for these students uh, and, and, and choose that actively. Um, should, uh, should we do questions like as we go or should we, I, I was going to save some time at the end. Okay, is it okay if I save some time at the end? Thank you, I'll, but I'll remember um, to come back to you. Um, the, uh, and then the third thing is around scalability and standardization. Um, as you think about how you build a sort of university model that can actually spread beyond sort of just one location, if you have really great content and, and syllabi that, that you can standardize and test and test the Princeton economics class versus the Harvard economics class, um, figure out what works best in, in what situations, um, you can suddenly have a much more scalable, high quality university experience. Um, so, so you talk about sort of taking that cost out of this structure, and, and, and part of it's about making the, the process cheaper, but I'll talk a little bit more about sort of our business model and, and costs in a minute. Part of, that, part of that sort of cost reduction, we're going to put right back into the model or, um, on teaching fellows. So I think the, 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 the sort of best way to explain what we mean, sort of how, how sort of active learning drives our thinking, is sort of talk you through what, what a day in one of our students' lives is. Uh, looks like already in our, in our pre-pilot, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to be built out as we, as we go into a full class in the fall. Um, so so, so the, the big shift is, um, you know, the, the term is flipped classroom. I don't know if, that, if, if anyone has heard that term. But the idea is that right now, um, in general, and, and this is different at the best universities, and I know at Princeton you guys do a great job of, of sort of in-person seminars and, and, and small group learning, but at most universities in the world, you, and, and high schools for that matter, you go into class and you get access to your professor and you get access to the students around you and you spend all that time sitting there quietly and just listening and trying to memorize and trying to remember and take notes. And then when you're actively working and trying to create something and build something and solve some problem, you're at home by yourself. So the idea is like, what would happen if you could flip that? And what would happen if when you're actually trying to do something, when you're actually trying to work through something and solve problems, which I think is the way a lot of folks learn the best, 
What if, what if you could do that during class when you have a teacher, coach, mentor right there? You have students next to you who can help you solve problems. A and take this sort of passive content consumption and do that at home when you're by yourself in your room on your computer any way you want. You can read it, you can watch a video, you can watch a video on 2x speed, um, et cetera. So, so that's the sort of uh, you know, uh, core idea around sort of the blended, blended learning, um, active learning shift. Um, so you, you can sort of look, we can sort of talk through the schedule, but you, know, you have discussion sections based around things like critical thinking. There's a, there's a class called Justice at, that's taught at Harvard by a guy named Michael Sandel, which is one of our first pilot classes. And teaching that in Rwanda in the wake of the genocide has been a, has been a really interesting experience. Um, having students really think about what's right and what's wrong and how do you make decisions in situations of moral uncertainty. Um, really pushing people to ask like the critical thinking, problem solving questions in real time. Um, so then the next chunk here is sort of professional skills. And we say professional skills, but that extends beyond writing a CV and interviewing. That extends for us to what a lot of, a lot of folks are calling non-cognitive skills. So there's this charter school network called KIPP that's been sort of one of the leaders um, of this movement, um, looking at what are the cultural shifts that you can teach a student that make a huge difference in their long-term outcomes. So there are things like grit and determination and not giving up when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you fail. There are things like optimism and taking on new projects aggressively and going after uh, you know, opportunities. Um, so, so it's a combination of sort of that non-cognitive culture stuff um, along with the actual practical stuff you need to, to do well in a job. Um, in the afternoon, uh, you know, we've got here this sort of software as a service class that's been, uh, that comes out of Berkeley as, a, as an online class. But that kind of uh, practical sort of employment focused problem solving, to do well in that class, to do well at learning how to, uh, I was a computer science undergrad, to, to do well at learning how to code, you need to have someone next to you who can like talk you through why you're, you know, where you missed a semicolon or, or, uh, or, or sort of how you think through a problem. In the afternoon, some of the, some of the sort of free time and, 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 and money that we free up by reducing our reliance on expensive professors goes to more intense mentoring and, and advising. Um, so you have an IM check-in, a Skype check-in, or an in-person meeting with your advisor in the afternoon. And then at night, whenever you want, and maybe this goes from, they did a study of when people at MIT were watching their online lectures, and it turns out that the highest volume was between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. So wh whenever it is that you want to engage and however you want to engage to actually download that, that passive content, that's sort of up to you. And that's the flipped classroom model. Um, the last thing I'll say is just this day in the life goes from about 9 AM to 10 PM. Um, this, this guy, Paul Tuff, who writes a lot about this sort of culture stuff and why certain charter schools have been successful. I really recommend this book, by the way, if, anyone, if anyone's interested in that world of stuff. Um, he, it's, called, it's called How Children Succeed. And the guy's last name is Tough, like, uh, like toughness. Um, so so he, 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 he writes about a study um, of, of how college students actually spend their time. And I'm sure no one in this room is like this. But the average college student spends about 14 hours per week on academics. And I, it reflects some of my college experience. I don't know about you guys. Um, so, so another another piece of this is what happens if you if you you know you're working with kids who are far behind and trying to catch them up for the global economy. What happens if instead of 14 hours a week of academics, you're doing 14 hours a day? So so then the last piece is really the work-based learning piece, um, and this is sort of a visual way to show the curriculum. And this is rough right now. We're still building it out. We're still in year one and, and piloting a lot of this stuff. Um, but this is sort of the, the, the plan in terms of uh, chunks of your time. Um, so, uh, you know, th there's a sort of uh, second year. At the, at the end of your second year, you're mostly done with your, the pure academic part of your experience. And, and even starting from year one, you're already working on employer-focused, uh, uh, sort of employment-focused skills and projects. Um, there are a lot of models. Like in Germany, they have... Uh, in German technical schools draw their professors entirely from local industry. And, and, and that's a piece of, 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 of how we'll even do the academic portion. Um, but then as you get on to your fourth year, and, and if we're actually able to cram in uh, enough learning in those first three years, we'd like you to have a one-year uh, internship 
that both gets you experience on the job and, and, and has you exposed to learning, but also gives you a year of sort of risk-free working and learning. And I don't, I don't know, uh, you know if everyone's had this experience, but I think a lot of folks get out into the world after, after education, and for the first couple years, it's tough to figure out how to be really great at, at your work. So we want to bridge that gap um, and also get students sort of learning through working. And, and that really drives another piece of the revenue model. So, so part of the cost reduction is by using technology whenever we can. But we hope we can reinvest a lot of that in the active learning portions and actually hire more teachers per student than a traditional university. Um, so the other piece of our business model that, that we've been playing with, and, and, and uh, I was telling Josh, this is actually one of the first few times we've sort of publicly talked about the full four-year scope of, of, of how we're planning. So all this is in, I, I should preface, all this is sort of beta and in discussion. I think it's cool we have this group together to give feedback and come up with new ideas. Um, our vision for the funding model is that fourth year, your fourth year, you are going to be working full time on a job. And actually, when I was in medical school, my fourth year I spent running a network of hospitals in Rwanda, paid as a full time employee, but getting credit through my university. And, and that's the idea. So um, at the end of the day, for the employer, they are hiring a sort of third year graduate of our program, paying a full salary, paying their normal full salary, which is between five and $10,000 a year. But that money, instead of going to the student, goes to Kepler. And the, uh, that money is used to not only pay for the ongoing education that, that goes through the fourth year, but also to subsidize the first three years of, of a student's education. Um, so for the student, the bottom line is you know thousand dollars or two thousand dollars versus the six or seven thousand dollars that a traditional university costs for the employer they get an employee who hopefully if we do a great job the first three years is stronger than than most entering employees plus has a built-in support system of mentors and coaches to actually make sure they do a great job that year plus they have an intern so at the end of the year the employer can proactively make the decision about keeping them on or continuing to work with them. Whereas in most developing countries, the labor laws are such that it's very, employers are very conservative about hiring people because it's very difficult to, to um, you know, transition someone out of an organization. Um, the other thing, and this is a little bit more, uh, a little bit of a more, um, you know, a deeper point for us, is what this model does is it forces us as a university to actually provide what we think students need. So if our students don't get jobs, if we fail, and our we have an employment rate, you know, the, I'm just thinking the pure online players, University of Phoenix or UNISA is a big one in South Africa, their graduation rates, forget employment, their graduation rates hover around 10%. So, so if, if, if we don't do an incredibly good job of actually preparing our students for work and getting them into the job market, we don't get paid. So, so, so that alignment of, of, of incentives is, is sort of core in our philosophy and, 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 and how we imagine the system and also looks better from both a student and employer perspective in terms of value proposition. Um, the, other, the other piece of the link to work is, is how do you decide when a student's done with school? So, so right now in universities, we, we say you're done with school when you have sat in a chair for X number of credit hours. And, and you have to sit in these certain chairs that are part of our university. We don't think that's necessarily the right way to decide when someone's done with their education. We think you should be done with your education when you can actually show, you can prove, that you have the skills that an employer wants you to have. So those are things like, these are just sort of examples, but can you write really compellingly? Um, can you lead a team through a complex problem? Can you write a business plan for a sort of new opportunity and think through all the, all the pieces inherent in that? So, so that, that's, that's all we think. And there are a handful of, of sort of small startup universities in the US that have recently been approved for accreditation to offer degrees based on that. They're called competency-based degrees. So instead of the credit hour, um, they are linked to whether you can demonstrate these skills. So I don't know if everyone's heard of uh, Clay Christensen. He's a, uh, he's a professor at Harvard Business School, and he's sort of he writes all about disruption, and, and this is sort of one of his brain, child, brain children. Um, so he has been working with this university in southern New Hampshire called Southern New Hampshire University, um, put a team of his 
uh, as sort of consultants and board members in this university. And they've built out a degree really based around this question. They've worked with the US government to get accreditation. Um, so what this does for us is not only does it deliver a degree that we really believe in that's based on skills, it also decouples the typical academic curriculum from the actual delivery of the degree. So we can sort of build the curriculum how we want using the best. It doesn't matter if all our content comes from one university or we pull the best from the Khan Academy, we pull the best from edX. What matters is can we get the outcomes for our students? So both you saw the business model, but then on the academic side, we also want to be tested on the outcomes that matter to our students, their ability to actually get skills that, that, that help them in jobs. And the, the final cool thing that this does is, is, as an employer in a lot of these countries, hiring is kind of guesswork because the credentials are tough to read. I mean, even in the US, you get, a, you get someone's CV and they've got a you know, 3.5 GPA from, from Princeton. Um, maybe you get their transcript at you know, a handful of employers. But even there, they got an A in intro to computer science. Like, but who knows what that means? So if you have a competency-based degree, suddenly you can double click on their a in computer science and actually read their code for what they wrote to prove that they have that competency. You can go to their intro to business class and watch, their, watch a video of them presenting to their class. So we call it sort of the double click transcript, but it's a, it's a way to actually match up um, students with the right employers. So some students might be great at analytic problem solving and terrible at teamwork, so they're going to make better accountants. And, and, that's, and that's something we think that both students and employers really benefit from having that transparency and that really effective matching. Um, so that's sort of the overview of our model. I just, I, you know, I think I'll, I'll just um, uh, talk about sort of where we are and where we're going as 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 the last piece. Um, so we've already been working in Rwanda for the last ten years. So we have this infrastructure and we have this sort of nights and weekends wrap around university. Uh, 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 set of programming. Um, and in Rwanda, we're launching um, a pilot of this full university. Um, so we had a call for applications over the last month or two. We've received about a little more than 3,000 applicants for uh, 30 spots. And that's exciting because it shows that there's a demand for this model and, 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 and folks want this. Um, it's challenging because it means you know we have to send out 2,970 rejections. Um, but over the next four years, we're going to pilot out this sort of full four-year curriculum in Rwanda. Um, but we're sort of impatient to, to try a few of the sort of third and fourth year ideas. Um, so one of the things we're exploring um, with a few partners in Kenya um, is can we launch a sort of shortened bridge program? So can we work with students during their third and fourth year of university uh, and provide some of the wraparound services, some of the job-based coaching and mentoring, not as heavily engage them in their sort of pure academics um, and really build out the, the sort of third and fourth year simultaneously. With the goal of by 2016 or so being able to have a full vision for how this four year model works and have some data behind it to, 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 to start really thinking seriously um, about expansion. Um, so, so that's an overview of our model, and and I would just say, you know, wh one of the one of the reasons I came down here was to, um, you know, ha have a chance to talk this this through uh, for ourselves. But a big part of something that's really core in what we're doing is uh, driving all these decisions with data and feedback and expertise and ideas. So, what I'd really love is um, everyone in this room, whether it's during a little conversation we can have now or um, in the future to really you know, give some thought to these ideas, what's going to work, what's not going to work, who are the right people we should be talking to as we develop, build out, and, and sort of uh, learn how to do this. Um, and really treat, treat sort of this presentation and the way we're treating the first uh, couple years of our, of our work really is a, a time to learn along with our, our students. So thank you guys so much for uh, listening to what we're working on. All right, so, so, but I'd love to hear everyone's questions and ideas and feedback and comments. Um, did you, I, I know you raised your hand earlier. Do you still have a thought? Yeah, which is, this sort of structure seems to take for granted that we know how to measure competency and learn, which mm -hmm. we don't, right? That if you give me 10 different computer science majors from 10 different, even American universities that are accredited, mm -hmm. They're going to have different, non-overlap, non-identical, non-sort of contained 
sets of knowledge. And figuring out what's important is really hard. And yeah. employers aren't going to agree on this. And even if the employers do agree, that doesn't mean the employers are right. That employers often are faddish and short-sighted and confused. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this seems to be hunting on the hard problem, which is figuring out what you want to teach. Um, so, so my sense of, of the challenge, so I think the, 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 the big picture of, of the point is, is, is the really hard stuff is, is how to decide what to teach. And we don't, we don't know if we have the answer. And we're, we're certain that most universities around the world do not have the answer. Doing A B testing between mm -hmm. you know, Princeton and Harvard undergraduate economics. What does that even mean? What does that mean? Like, so what is the phrase A B testing? How would you do that comparison given that Harvard and Princeton might disagree about what it is they want to teach? So let me let me just zoom out a little bit. So I think I think the, the core of your point is that nobody knows how to decide exactly how to prepare someone for employment. And that's what the economist writes about, and that's what McKinsey studies, and it is a huge global problem. You are you're dead on. Our sense is that one way to take a step forward in that, in that world, um, we're not, we don't have the answer, but one way to take a step forward is to engage employers a little bit more effectively. So employers won't have the answer immediately. You're right. However, though, employers do make decisions. So, so the outcome that matters to students in Rwanda is not, I'm, unfortunately, for, you know, for the world, is not whether they're perfectly complete, philosophically adept, you know, creative, uh, you know, um, what, what really, the outcomes that really matter to most of the consumers of, of, of academics are whether they can get jobs that can pay for their, you know, five brothers and sisters, their mother who has HIV, their, you know, whether they can actually get into the workplace. And we think we can improve what you teach to get that very specific outcome. Whether that's the you know, capital R right thing to teach and whether like, globally that should be every university teaching that, I don't know. I think it is a step forward in the right direction for the markets we're working in. Um, so, um, lots of issues, lots of questions. One of them is uh, if you have small enough classes, which you're probably going to need, small enough not in the classroom size, but also mm -hmm. like, you can't probably have this model work at you know, open at 10,000 people at once. You probably need to start small and see what's going on. And you're going to provide support with them. How do you avoid something like creaming, which comes up a lot in this kind of work, in which you get the students mm -hmm. that are the best? I mean, if you've got 3,000 applicants and you're picking 30, mm -hmm. you've got good students. And I'm sure you'll do something for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but very often, that doesn't, you know, the sort of the differential impact isn't as much because even though it's, hard, it looks like a lot because mm -hmm. your people go somewhere. Yeah. But it's if you could do a counterfactual, maybe the 34th number 31st is also just as good, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really bring that much to the country. How do you avoid that? How do you do it so that it, the differential impact is big enough mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than you got the best students and you gave them an opportunity? Yeah. But. So it sounds like there are two questions in there, yeah. and I think one of the questions is um, uh, how do we measure and evaluate our work, and how do we make sure that what we're measuring and evaluating isn't just the quality of the students who came in. And it's actually a, a, a pretty profound question because there's this study, I don't know if anyone's heard of Academically Adrift. It was a very big, uh, it got a lot of press a couple years ago, but they basically measured students at the beginning of university and at the end of university and, and saw how they did. And there was no difference in any of their sort of cognitive and intellectual tasks. So, so you don't really learn anything in most universities. The, the other, the, yeah, well, well, okay, but but on 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 uh, on on one set of tests, it's hard to see a huge impact. The other, it's harder to measure. Exactly. Sure, sure. The, the other. Sure. The the other the other study is 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 just in terms. Of, so the outcome we're most interested and our students are actually most interested, so that drives us, is really income and getting a job. There's another study, actually out of a Princeton uh, professor whose name escapes me. Um, students who applied to Princeton and Harvard and sort of the top universities um, and chose to or accepted and chose to attend, and students who were accepted and chose not to attend, how, how do their incomes look uh, in the future? And, and everyone, you know, you talk about your network you build at a place like Princeton, you talk about the quality of the teaching, versus you know, a lot of the state schools and, and lower caliber academically uh, schools, 
you know, five and ten years out, there was no statistically significant difference in their incomes. So again, there, I'm sure there are lots of methodological problems, but when you, when you um, look at sort of outcomes, no university, very few universities have figured out how to produce results and how to turn, how to catch kids up. Um, so, so measuring is a challenge. I think we hope to draw as much as we can on sort of the charter school network. So my partner um, in setting up this organization and setting up this university uh, just left a school called Excel Academies in Massachusetts, which is which over the last couple of years has been the highest performing charter school network in Massachusetts. There are lots of questions around you know whether or not their their students, yeah, whether or not their students, to the best to the best of academics at. Uh, to the best of academics' ability so far, it doesn't look like there's creaming at at at, at, a, at a subset of these charter schools. But again, it's 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 a concern. Is there something like lottery acceptance? I mean, this is a challenge. If somebody mm -hmm. really, I mean, if you believe in this model, yeah, you should do lottery acceptance to some segment because mm -hmm. as long as you're choosing your students, yeah, really, no, I, I think it's a really cool idea. Actually, any thirty people, yeah, so why not any? Yeah. I think it's a really cool idea, actually, and, and it's not something we've talked about. I was just talking to Josh about getting some help and ideas with our M&E thinking, and I really love that idea. Because I think that the best charter school studies are, are done with lotteries. Right. Even then, you wonder if there's creaming on who stays in school versus who drops sure, out, and et cetera. Sure, but, but I love that happens, idea. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. So I'd love to push back on this idea yeah. of disruption, um, in part because we have a language that I'd like to suggest for you of what you're yeah. proposing, which is a global trade school or a global mm -hmm. vocational school, right? Mm -hmm. We have this model of skills-based job-ready education, which unfortunately in the United States has been severely decoupled from secondary education. So, yeah. you know, maybe using this idea that you're doing global vocational education will help um, short-circuit some of the questions around disruption that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so connected to that is the comment that, um, you know, the assumption that people go to university to learn skills, I think, is one that goes unquestioned. And people go to university for a lot of reasons. Primary, in the United States, it's still considered a huge credential, mm -hmm. and a credential that in and of itself has economic value. Right? Sure. So it's not the skill that you come out with. Mm -hmm. in it. And once you take those early, that study that said there's no difference in five to 10 years out, once you take that five, go mm -hmm. past that 10 years, there's yeah. huge disparities mm -hmm. there, OK? So Interesting. something people get from university is social and cultural capital. Yeah. And I would think that based in what you have done in your wraparound program, you've seen that social and cultural capital are as important as content. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that we know from university education that we're providing for our students. We're providing. Yeah. You know, at Princeton, you're providing a spot for Princeton students to connect. University of Washington, my home institution, one of those mm -hmm. um, less um, reputable, as you call them, uh, institutions. Um, you know, we provide a different kind of network. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, providing that social and cultural capital is still as labor intensive, from your point of view, than the content. So, you might, what you might be doing is actually replacing the the content with less expensive content, mm -hmm. but setting up a situation in which you're building these small cohorts that are still very expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. An internship program that you're talking about is going to be incredibly expensive. And in US labor law, you're not going to be able to take someone's salary away from them if they're getting mm -hmm. paid. So I don't know what you know local African laws are, but yeah. actually paying for someone and not giving them the salary is not not kosher in the U.S. in U.S. Okay, so it sounded like there were a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ideas. Yeah, I think there's a lot of problems. Yeah, that yeah. Proposing yeah. Them, like, so let me just let me just let, let me maybe I'll try to take them one by one. Yeah. So in terms of the last point, labor law, uh, it, I think you'd you'd really be interested in an organization called Year Up. Um, have you heard that? No. Well, they've gotten to be they've gotten a lot of attention there. Uh, they partner with um, mo most major financial institutions in the states, um, but they have exactly that revenue model. So they're funded by a, uh, the, the sort of mechanism of how it works is they're funded um, to sort of provide, to sort of outsource the an in industry training. So they get, but, but it's exactly the same, uh, lay, uh, it's exactly the same revenue model as sort of we described. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if there is a specific 
law or, or rule you're, you're concerned about, but I don't actually think that's an issue. Standards Act is basically being investigated for unpaid internships for educational value mm -hmm. in the United States. So you might want to look at that um, Department of Justice investigation into whether unpaid yeah. internships for educational purpose in the U.S. are legal. Yeah, so, so certainly we don't believe in, yeah, certainly we don't believe in unpaid internships. Um, and, and, and maybe what you're getting at is how we structure this, whether it's a loan that a student agrees to pay back. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't actually think there are any legal issues with uh, loaning students money that they pay back from, from, yeah. their, from their salaries. Yeah. Um, but, but I think the, the, the core of, I think, what you're, I'm just trying to separate the different pieces. So the, the vocational, using the, the vocational language to talk about this. So the challenge there is that most universities in the world look at Harvard and Princeton and say, that's the model. That's, that's a really good school. That's what we have to copy. And what that's led to, outside of a few places, so Germany is a great example of where the vocational sector is thriving and effective. But in most of the markets we're working in, and certainly in the US, over, over years of people trying to copy Harvard and Princeton, vocational education, especially in employers' mind, which is sort of the most important to us, that brand is, is, uh, is pretty tough to, to, to sell to an employer. So employers don't want to hire people who went to anything with the word vocational anywhere around it in the markets we're working with. I'm not sure, maybe there are local markets that are different, but I think in general that that's true in the US, that, that a full bachelor's degree, uh, a full university degree is what everybody wants. The, the cultural capital piece, and I'd love to peel that apart and see what you actually mean by that, that there's, there's one piece which is the brand of your university, and that is extremely important. But your brand and your network are built in, in, in our experience in these countries, certainly with, with Generation Rwanda, our brand um, was built by delivering employers, students who were incredibly effective on day one of their employees. So the average attrition rate in a lot of the companies we work with is in the 60 or 70 percent range. So people hire, hire a student, they, they sort of guess at who's the right student, they hire a student, and 70 percent of those students are not with them in a couple of years because they don't have the skills. And that's what builds a brand. And that's what builds broader cul cultural uh, capital. So, yeah, so cultural, is that what no, I'm understanding? Capital, knowing how to perform the so-called soft skills. Yeah. Right? Knowing how to be, knowing how to be professional. Yeah. In institutions like Princeton, students probably come in with that. Exactly. Having learned that from their parents, from yeah. their middle, upper, middle class parents. Yeah. In, in, you know, in institutions where we actually deal with many working class students, mm -hmm. you know, that's a lot of what we do in teaching from the working class. We teach them how to be middle class. Yeah. And that's exactly. expensive to do. That involves one-on-one yeah. -on -one conversations. Yeah, certainly. And and you know, so the hope is that is that by subsidizing it, whether it's structured as a human capital loan or you know what what uh, however it's structured, by um, getting employers engaged with with contributing to the education of students and by replacing what at least at the top line is sort of the most expensive part of the university education, leaving aside the capital. Um, we really have to do that. We have to have uh, more intensive and more expensive sort of one-on-one -on -one training. So I think you're exactly right. And, and overall, I'd say I, I love, we love getting sort of pushback and questions and hard questions. So I hope, I'd love to get your card and get more hard questions from you in the future. <laughs> Thank you. I, I sort of agree that with your, uh, agree with Gina's first point that the, um, by using the language of markets and directing your uh, consumers towards what employers want, the, the more sensible comparison point might be technical colleges, vocational, polytechnic. Yeah. And, and I think the universities you, that, you, that, you, that you want to try to replace or displace with this model are, are probably not the right comparison point, but just because they do different things for a different subpopulation. Hmm. Um, but my question is actually about the professors that you just um, Yeah. I also wonder if um, the Rwandan professors are the most expensive part of the Rwandan educational system. Could you riff for a bit about what you think the cultural impact of having um, a white faculty from the U.S. teaching politics to Rwandan students, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, economics, you know, relying on Westerners, mm -hmm. um, and taking the Rwandan faculty out of the loop? Yeah. So that's, 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 I think that's a great point. And I think both from a cost structure perspective and from a cultural perspective, we can't do that. So that's 100% um, over the next two to three years, we have to figure out how to uh, 
train um, local uh, staff members. We already do that with our current program. So our current wraparound services are all taught by Rwandans. Um, uh, but we have to figure out how to duplicate and scale that. Um, when you talk about the professor piece, so the, you know, whether you're watching a, a, a Harvard economics lecture or whether you're listening in class, most of the textbooks that are used in higher education around the world are written by folks in developed economies. So that's already an issue, that most of the passive content comes from places that are not local. What we hope we can do, though, by, by sort of making passive content a little bit less central to the job of university, we hope that, that, that as, we, as we have Rwandan teachers, as we do now in our, in our wraparound services, as we have Rwandan teachers actually spending tons more time with students one-on-one, -on -one, they get a lot more local engagement with, with the people they're learning from. You know, long term, we hope, uh, and this is a much bigger question about the role of the university, but, but as there's a shift from, as there's maybe more of a split between sort of vocational education and research institutions, maybe there are opportunities to have, and we've talked about doing this, can we work with a university in Rwanda to produce one of these MOOCs, you produ produce, a, produce a, 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 a the, the passive content side, can we help people produce the passive content side in a format that can reach, reach large spectrums? Um, but certainly having, having Rwandans doing the teaching is financially and uh, philosophically really core to what we do. It's a great point. Um, in the back. I don't think you mentioned this, but why Rwanda? Why not, and I'm not being facetious, yeah. Camden? Why not Camden or New Trenton, Jersey? New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so why, why Rwanda? Yeah, so, um, well, so Two reasons. First of all, we are already there doing higher education because when I graduated from college, my first job was on the ground in Rwanda with the Clinton Foundation, and that's where we got this off the ground. So we've spent the last 10 years sort of learning and, and building an educational program in Rwanda, not Camden. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of the easy answer. Um, but the other piece of it is like um, there's this uh, there's this Dr. Atul Gawande who writes about the U.S. healthcare system and why we haven't made a change. And he writes about, and I remember saying this as a, as a doctor, but we, he writes about patients coming in with tumors. And patients will come in with this big tumor. And the, you know, the doctors would sit around and say, how could you have waited this long to come in? Like this is, you know, how do you even get around? Um, but it's because it happens very slowly. So in, in, in the US, the, the, there are some of these same problems. Um, you know, I think they're not exactly the same. And they're, they're certainly fantastic. I mean, I, you know, you mentioned the University of Washington. It's another fantastic higher ed institution. I mean, I think the, the, uh, the you know, there certainly are institutions like the University of Phoenix is sort of our, our counterpoint of, of, of a less academically uh, sophisticated university. But um, in the U.S., we've, we've had these problems growing up very slowly. So employers in the U.S. have built out really sophisticated training programs. The U.S. Department of Higher Ed and, and banks have, have put together really sophisticated loan programs that have huge capital. So it's not as sort of urgent a crisis in the US. The unemployment rate compared to Rwanda is probably one fifth or one tenth. Of course, of course. Is, yeah. All the things you were saying before, yeah. Yeah. in the cultural context yeah. are, are true here as well as there. No question, no question. This, this organization, Year Up, is actually doing a lot of what we're we're talking about in the U.S. They're doing it as a, on a smaller scale as that one-year bridge program. So there are folks working on that, and it's not out of the question for us to try to take some of these lessons to the U.S. I think the core of our answer is we know the most about Rwanda. We have an infrastructure in Rwanda, and on a countrywide level, on an employer level, everybody says today this is a crisis. We are ready to invest and focus and work on this problem. In the U.S., there are pockets where that's true. But because the problem has come on us over many, many years, it's a, it's, it, it, it's a little bit harder to build sort of a national consensus around taking a very different approach very quickly. But, but not out of the question. It's a great point. You know, it's definitely something we've talked about and thought about. In the back. Um, if you ask a lot of college professors why, don't, why they don't teach more vocational skills, I think one very common answer that you'll get is that those skills necessarily um, go out of fashion or out of date very soon, get obsolete very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's especially true in my field, for example, in computer science. Yeah. That's part of the reason I would say that that component is pretty minimal in a place like Princeton. And I completely mm -hmm. understand it's a different context and uh, you know the demand that you're seeing from your students is different. Mm -hmm. But never 
for the list, have you looked at the skills that you're teaching, how long they're actually relevant in the market? And yeah. also broken up by different different sectors. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. And I think my answer with that, to that would be that we're not just teaching skills that employers want. That's what our students are asking for, and that's what employers are asking for, and that's what governments are asking for. So we are doing that. But really core, I mean, I, you go back to the day in the life, you know, half the student's day is, is spent talking about Michael Sandel's justice class, right? Learning how to critically think, how to evaluate a new set of information, all these soft skills that let you adapt to a changing marketplace. And how we measure success is not in whether or not they get a job. It's not an employment rate on the day of graduation. It's whether or not we can sort of sustainably improve the lives of these students and their families. So it's a, it's a great point that you need to do more than teach directly what employers are asking for today. We think that's a minimum, and, and we should do that. But on top of that, if we're going to be dramatically ramping up the amount of academics students are doing, we also need to add in the sort of non the softer skills that let them adapt along with the environment companies. So unfortunately, we have to close up the formal part of this because it's 1.30. Um, but it's a really, really rich discussion, and let's uh, continue it here and going forward. So thanks a lot. Thank you.